This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, not busy with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature, let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease, whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be happy. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to false views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Hang on. See you later. <laughs> okay, so as a brief introduction to the meditation talk, you can still hear me, it's okay? Hopefully. <laughs> Uh, one of the main important things about meditation, which is really interesting, is this thing called the middle way. And it's something which at the beginning seems a little strange and esoteric and a little hard to find. But the more and more you meditate, the more and more you find that it's just everywhere. And it's extremely useful to manage your meditation to an extent because there's an extent where meditation is a letting go. You take your hands off the wheel, you relax, you just let the process unfold. But there needs to be a bit of preliminary work to set that up. And that's getting to that point where you can get to that stage where you just relax and you don't need to do anything. So meditation is wonderful to develop the middle way because it's something which you only really find by experience, by finding out what happens when you're sitting on the cushion and it makes it more interesting that it's basically an ongoing experiment. It's always sort of every time it's different and that's a good thing. It's a good thing that it's different every time because that way it's always fresh and interesting. It's always new. There's never a dull moment and that's the thing. I was actually quite lucky that a friend of mine recently uh, told me that he found that Meta was being overlaid onto the, onto the moment, onto the experience. And I was like, yes, great, because that's what it is. Finding that joy, finding that peace, finding that happiness is something that you give to the moment. It's not so much something that just automatically happens. And that's a big thing to, to kind of find because firstly, it's very empowering because you realize that how you adjust your meditation is, is up to you. You know, it's, it's something which is, is quite easy to do, which is wonderful. 
And then once you get to that point where it's just really nice, then you can just step back and it just happens by itself. And that's really nice too. So with meditation in the middle way, <clears throat> sometimes we go too far this way, sometimes we go too far this way. Sometimes we're too strict and tight and we must sit for so-and-so time and be like this and have a perfect posture and, and, and everything else. And sometimes we're just going, oh, you know, whatever. And we, we just kind of let go slightly too much too early. So it's always a gauge. It's always this soft, fuzzy feel that you kind of discover as you go. So for a few more minutes, we can sort of evaluate this a bit more and we can have a consideration that it feels right. And that's really the, the benchmark we're talking about, that it feels right. Because in the middle way is not an intellectual game. It's not something which you think your way through. It's something that you feel and it's something that you explore. And that's what makes it so <clears throat> beautiful because it's an art at the same time. Like any art, the more you do it, the better it gets because you become more skilled at it. And this is exactly the same. So, because <clears throat> my voice is giving out, it's been uh, <clears throat> a very hot, dry, dusty day. Uh, let's make a start. Because we might as well. So, everybody, please make yourself comfortable. You can settle into the chair and we can begin. And when you're ready, close your eyes. <clears throat> there we go. And the first thing to become aware of is just how you're feeling now. What is it that you feel? Now at the beginning, you might not feel that much. You might just feel settling in, you might feel a few aches and pains, you know, sitting on the chair or the cushion. And this is the time to use that to relax, to settle, to really enjoy this experience because this joy is something that we give to the moment. It's not necessarily something that's always there. It's something that we give. So we'll just spend a few minutes just moving if we need to and just relaxing. And place your attention on your breathing. And in this case, use, the bre use your breathing and your breath to relax more. As you breathe out, just let the tension fade away with the breath. As you breathe in, allow the tension to loosen up. If it helps, take a few deep breaths just to let it go.
And as you breathe in, send relaxation to where you need it. It's good to check with your head first and loosen any tightness there. Is your face too tight? Perhaps a soft smile may help. and then move to your neck and your shoulders. And just allow it to relax more. Just wiggle it if you need to. And as you breathe in, just let the tension dissolve. and then move to your shoulders and your upper body and relax there. And then move to your arms. Are they comfortable? Do you need to move them slightly? Use this time to help, help them relax. And then move to your abdomen, your stomach. And just relax. Just let the tension go. The greatest gift in the world you can ever give yourself is to relax. And then move your awareness to your lower back and just help it settle. As you relax your body, you may find that other parts need adjustment as well, and that's fine. And now move your attention to your legs. 
and let them stretch a little, settle a little. The process of relaxation takes time. It doesn't happen all at once. So this is just about helping the process happen. And now as you breathe, just see how you can relax the breath, how you can make the breath more comfortable. Relaxing is also trust. It's trusting yourself that you can do this, that you do deserve a break now and again. And as you relax more, the energy and the brightness in the mind comes together. So use the breath just to help the process. If your mind wanders off the process, if your mind wants to go out and explore other things, that's okay. But sometimes it's interesting to know how we're just trying to get away from ourselves. Because meditation is a time that we come back to ourselves. We build a better relationship with ourselves. And we enjoy the time more.
if it feels right, continue with your breathing, breathing out the stress and tension and relaxing more. However, if you wish, you can also return to scanning your body again and relaxing some more. It's always good to revisit times and places to see if any tension has come back up or if it would like to stretch a bit more and unwind. And now, bring a positive emotion to the breath because the breath can help that emotion spread. And you can choose any that you wish. So as you breathe in and breathe out, you might breathe in metta and kindness. You might breathe in compassion. You might breathe in joy and happiness. whatever feels right. But as you breathe in and out, let that positive emotion spread throughout your entire body and fill the room that you're sitting in.
And now share that positive emotion to those that you love. Think of the person who comes closest to mind and share that emotion with them. And now send that positive emotion further and include more people. As you breathe in and out, let the breath carry it out. As if with every breath in and out, you're filling the entire space with that emotion. and see how far you can send this emotion. How far can you share it and spread it?
And now as we're approaching the end of the meditation, spend the time to bring that emotion back to yourself. As if you can store it inside yourself so you can access it whenever you need it. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. And welcome back. <laughs> I can see some of you are doing a good stretch and that's really good. It's always good to get the energy flowing again after a good meditation. It really helps, it helps settle in. Hello Ajahn. Um, can you just give us an overview of a day in the life of a monk? Ah, well that, that's different for every monk and different for every nun as well. Some, so we, we do tend to keep different um, patterns according to which monastery we live in or you know where we are in seniority and whether we're on retreat or not it differs as well. But generally uh, at Bodhinyana, we're up, say, uh, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, whenever um, they wish to get up. And then we can meditate in the morning where it's nice and quiet. Uh, then usually we just, depends what day it is, on our work days we would come down for breakfast and have our work meeting and then a work session which lasts till about 10.30. Then uh, we go in, have uh, the, the rice offering called the Pindabat, and then... Um, after that's finished, after we finish lunch, then we're pretty much free to go back to our huts and meditate or study or everything else. Uh, for Westerners, it can be good to have structure, but sometimes that can go too far as well, and sometimes it's good to be unstructured, because un being unstructured is actually more challenging, because you have to be with yourself, and you have to take responsibility for the time that we spend here. So, uh, of course, it's so easy, you can just sort of, ah, you know, just relax and forget about it and da 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 da, you know. But, um, you know, if you keep on doing that, eventually you'll find yourself just, you know, the days and nights just slip past and you're going, what am I even doing here? Uh, so, that kind of, that unstructured does help a lot because it brings, it means you have to be mindful, you have to be engaged. But uh, some of us, we're into meditation a lot, and some of us are more into the academic and scholastic side of Buddhism, studying the texts and, and everything else, which is great. Some are more into the, the building and administration side, doing more of the services behind the scenes to keep the, uh, uh, the whole thing running. 
Uh, so we all have different, different sides and, and it makes a lots of different people to work together and that's a, that's a good thing. If we were all the same, it just really wouldn't work. So does that kind of uh, help or uh, was there something more specific you were interested in? Uh, sure. Um, specifically, I was uh, very interested in knowing uh, the work period. Uh, I understand that um, starting from even in your uh, residences, you do everything on your own, like building the kuti and such. So to me, it feels like it's a very, very tiring uh, process to do everything on your own. So how do you manage that? Uh, well, that you have to, I've, I've listened to a lot of Ajahn Brahm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've listened to a lot of Ajahn Brown's talks and he had mentioned several times how he had built walls and climbed up and poured the concrete and such. Um, is it still the case that new monks who come in uh, have to do work like that? Uh, learn new trades and... Not so much. Yes, it's, there's a yes and no. Generally, people who are already skilled in that uh, tend to be invited to take part in that. So we, for building and things like that, and we have so many shire regulations and so many standards we have to meet, um, it can't be an amateur job. It has to be something where we really pull in those who have the skills and trades to do that. But there are so many jobs we have to do. There's so many things in the monastery to keep it clean, keep it organized, keep it running. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's a matter of balance. And for some, they do need to have more service because it does give a sense of community, it gives a sense of place, it gives a sense of I've participated and that really helps their meditation. For some of course work can be an escape as well and it can go too far the other way. That's what I sort of mentioned earlier, there's this middle way approach which seems really fuzzy at the beginning but the more and more that you go into it the more and more you see okay working too much need to pull back a bit, go on retreat, rest a bit, oh, starting to get a bit too lazy, starting to go with the flow a little, you know, too, too lazy, you could say, and uh, that's, that's when you can say, okay, we have to pull it back in because your meditation starts to fall apart. So on one hand, it is very busy and it is very challenging. And that's the, the life many monks and nuns live. But in a sense, that does make you readdress how you approach these things because you really need to have a positive attitude. You really need to sort of look and go, you know, what is this all about? Because if you're cleaning the monastery, um, it's, you're doing it every day, basically. Every day the leaves fall, the you know, toilets need to be cleaned, the upstairs uh, where we have our meal needs to be cleaned, every, the kitchen needs to be cleaned, every day things need to be done. Uh, but there's a shift where we are engaged in doing the work, but then we step back to our, our hearts and we let that go. Because that's, it's like we, we step into a different world, you could say. You know, the huts are for the meditation, it's for the study, it's for the practice. Practice is involved as well in the work side, but not so much because you can't be all noble silence like you're on in a retreat center when you're, when you're building, <laughs> building huts and fitting electrical fittings. You, you need to focus and you need to communicate. So it's, it's a shift. But, you know. For some, it, they take to it, some find their niche, some find that they're actually working harder than they were in lay life. I've known quite a few people who have left that way. So, any other questions? Or? Thanks, Ajahn. You're welcome. Uh, Ajahn, there's a question in the chat box from Seville in Germany. She's asked, how did you realize that you wanted to become a monk? Um, that is really a long, long story. And the longer I'm doing this, the more and more it seems that the story is more complex than I thought. Um, when I was young, I was haunted by this um, feeling, this, this idea that 
um, the cause of my problem, the cause of my suffering was ignorance. But of course I was ignorant of what I was ignorant of. <laughs> so I was studying everything, I was reading anything I could get my hands on. Um, and you know, it just didn't go, get anywhere. But the problem basically was it kind of, it, the more I look back on it, the less it seems that it was actually sort of, uh, you know, a conscious decision I made. It just seems that it was just naturally moving in this direction and then just, um, then it just happened. For some they make a choice, for some it's, it's something they do for, for a few months, for a few weeks, they go off to Thailand or to Southeast Asia and do a temporary ordination. For some it's, it, it doesn't actually seem a big shift for us, for some of us I think. I'm not sure. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi, this is Martha. I'm in Spartanburg, South Carolina, the United States. Uh -huh. um, thanks all for doing, the, doing this where I can see it in a lifetime. Thank you. I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts about using a mantra like Buddha, 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 or something like that? Mm -hmm. I mean, generally speaking, I've just been watching the breath mm -hmm. for years and years, and um, I still have really bad monkey mind. And I've just recently introduced Buddha, I don't know what your, I would just like to hear what your thoughts are on that. Thank you. Oh, sure. Mantras are great. Uh, see, the thing is, is that uh, with meditation, it's always about what you need now. So if you've been practicing for years and breath meditation is just kind of like, it's not giving you any impetus or any, you don't feel like this is what I want to be doing. Maybe put the breath meditation aside for a little while. And if the the Buddha, the, the mantra is working for you, fantastic. Um, I use I use mantras myself sometimes. Buddha, metta, Buddha, metta. That works really well for me sometimes. It depends. There's, there's times that the mantra can really help bring you into the moment, and that's wonderful. But there's times that also you might feel that an emotion type meditation, such as metta or compassion or joy, uh, is is more fulfilling because the really the whole point of all the meditation practices that the Buddha taught are to let go, are to relax, so that you don't need to control anymore, you don't need to do this anymore. It's all about getting to the point where you can just relax enough and go deeper, 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 because that's what helps generate that ability to see things more clearly, to develop your insight a bit better. So if if uh, breath meditation becomes a bit too routine or a bit too uh, ritualized or a bit too boring, um, which it often does, um, it's good to experiment, it's good to explore a little wider. And if Buddha works for you, fantastic, keep on doing it. How, how does the, the experience work for you? I just started doing the Buddha. Um, I really when I first started meditating, I was using pain a lot. I was a really great meditator on that very first, you know, 10-day retreat. And looking back, I was really just kind of sitting double loaded, you know, just trying to rise above the pain of it all. So that's why I like the way y'all go through the whole body and sit in a way that's comfortable. Because I think I was not really meditating like I'm supposed to. I was just too vain not to just sit in the right you know, in a way that was comfortable. So, and I've just, just started the Bhutto thing, but what I, I really like about this, I can bring in um, an emotion before, and I was using joy, and just like, like you just did, I, that, that worked really well for me, you know, you know, and using that both on, um, you know, for the whole world, joy to the world, and then, you know, bringing it back to myself, that was really helpful. So, um but thank you too for allowing me to let go of the breath and use a, use a mantra if I need to. So thank you for that and I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. See, the thing is what we find with uh, retreat centers, and we're, we're quite lucky we have Jana Grove just up the road here, is a lot of people when they go on retreat, um, when they have really good success times on the retreat, it's because you know, I'm here on retreat, you know, you've saved up all year to be able to make a break and and go off on a retreat, and, and it's paradise, it's wonderful. Uh, and some people get a great lift. Some, unfortunately, they, they really want to 
go hard for the technique and really force themselves through the pain. I've met, a, unfortunately, quite a lot of people, including a very close friend, who feel they, they need to push through the pain to, to progress. And unfortunately, when you get deeper, deeper and really look at this situation, it's like waging war on yourself and it just doesn't really get you anywhere. And ironically, this is the first teaching the Buddha gave was on the, noble, uh, was on the middle way, where he sort of said this ascetic waging war on yourself just doesn't do it. It just doesn't help. So uh, being, exploring and trusting yourself is, is wonderful. So, uh, you know, I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> hey, any, anyone else? Uh, this is Sangeeta again. I do have a lot of questions, but I'm just waiting for others to uh, get their questions in if they do have. I don't want to um, take over the meeting. Well, if you have one. Okay. <laughs> um, Ajahn, <laughs> sure. So to become a fully ordained nun, mm -hmm. um, is there a prerequisite um, in regard to knowing the Buddhist texts and suttas to a certain level? Um, it's an ideal, certainly it's an ideal to have a, a firm understanding of what the Buddha actually taught because there's so many later re-evaluations and reinterpretations and of course uh, throughout the uh, years there were fashions of, you know, and different ideas that came in which kind of if, if you really can study them well, you cannot see where they, where they fit it in and how they arose, but whether they're really relevant still is a good question. The thing about the middle way is that is, is something that's common to every Buddhist tradition. And in fact, where you find real teachers, you find that they are adjusting to the middle way. So, uh, for example, a, a culture which might have a deep investment in the supernatural Yet you find, when you look at their tradition, there's a strong element of study, the strong element of debate, rational thinking. But then when you go into a different culture, which is very scholastic, very academic, very intellectual, like the Zen tradition, they say, give up the books, just sit. So there's always this adjustment going on. So it's very important to have a bit of a grasp on the text at the beginning, because then you know sort of the direction that this is leading towards and uh, you're less likely to get caught up in confusion and, um, you know, this tradition, this tradition teaches this way, this teacher says this, who's, that seems contradictory, who's right. Um, it becomes very easy when you sort of see, ah, culturally, they were pulling this direction or this direction, they're trying to pull it into the middle. So, to be a fully ordained nun, it is useful to have uh, an understanding of the text, absolutely. But, of course, that can go too far, if, you know you can become obsessed by it and, um, and more confused. So getting the, the gist of it and then once you start meditating, you find that this is an exploration as it goes. You know, you find your sensitivity improves um, quite a bit more and uh, you, you find for yourself what the middle way is. So I hope that helps. Sure. Yes, sure. So if um, if while I'm being still a lay person, if I want to prepare myself to such an eventuality, mm -hmm. um, the suttas are huge, right? Are there any reference materials that says where to start, in which order to read the suttas? And Not so much. Uh, and in fact, you know, this, there's a lot of suttas. You, you will be spending the rest of your life reading them. Uh, generally, it's recommended just to stick with the the earliest ones, the what's called the Dharma Chakapawatana Sutta, which is the, said to be the first discourse. That's the one that teaches the middle way and the Four Noble Truths. Then there's the Anatalakana Sutta, the Fire Sermon. Just sort of stick with the the earliest ones because they show the the main premise. All the later ones are basically reflections and expansions off that, but. Uh, um, getting those core ones, the rest of them are just variations to different people and they help, but 
you don't need to go through all of them. You'll be spending the rest of your life doing that. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? I still have one more if that well, I Maggie know. asked in the well Ma saying you to hold on about Maggie in the chat and asked she was wondering so it's an official recording of the uh, of the suttas anywhere that you know of. Does anybody know? Well, actually, most of them are on the BSWA website. Uh, they have their sutta classes there, which they have every weekend. Um, and Arjun Brahmali has recently finished a course on the dependent origination. Um, and they're starting to do one on the Eightfold Path. Um, well recommended to, to check those ones out. But uh, there's a huge collection of sutta discourses um, um, on the BSWA website. It's a great resource. Doesn't You know, it's it's... There's loads of them. It's fantastic. Um, uh, otherwise, there's quite a few. Sutta Central is a good website to visit if you want to read the text because they have different translations and comparison studies. Great resource. Um, but quite honestly, the BSWA one is a good one to start with. Oh, yes, yes, yep. Yeah? Yep. Um, not so much question, but just um, a request. Okay. Because, um, because you know, um, we are stuck in, um, in, the, in the situation and could not go for retreat and so on. Mm -hmm. So, um, I just have a request if you can give us a blessing at uh, before finish. So just to um, keep up the spirit um, to carry on, uh -huh. um, to do more practice, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, just to to keep the spiritual the mental energy for, for practice. This is the request from Becky. Thank you. Uh -huh. Well, Becky, um, the thing is, which is interesting about Dharma, about the practice, is that the, it's, it's something that pulls you in. The more that you meditate and the more that it's fulfilling and you find that, that relaxation, that, that peace and that clarity that comes with it, uh, it becomes far more preferable to do. And you find actually that uh, you find your own blessing, you could say. It's that the motivation comes from, from just doing it. It doesn't need anything else. It's wonderful. Uh, and it's, it's just time well spent. So uh, the blessings with you, you know, is, is where you find it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, man. So yeah. nice to see you, really. Well, yeah. <laughs> because, uh, uh, yeah, that is, although we cannot come to Perth, mm -hmm. I cannot come to Perth, but um, the, the, we at the Zoom can see you and can be part of the meditation group. It, it seems like a connection, and this is really good. Thank you. Well, it's it's thanks to the Armadale group. They they're putting it together. So uh, you know, thanks to everyone who comes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you. Really. <laughs> You've got another sense by customer valuable. Another customer. I said another satisfied customer. Ah. <laughs> well, it's, that's the thing. It's, it's wonderful when they, 
sort of uh, find that satisfaction in their own practice because then it just takes off. It just goes on its own steam. It's wonderful. You know, that's, that's really where it gets... You really know you're moving in the right direction. <laughs> so, any last questions before we finish up? Yes, I have one more question. Okay. Uh, this is regarding one of the eight precepts. Mm -hmm. uh, um, again, I've been trying to follow the monastic life while I'm still in the lay life. Mm -hmm. So I have been recently trying to uh, not eat before noon or one o'clock. I'm trying to slowly... Um, 3 p.m. to 1 p.m. to noon. Um, I don't know if you can answer this question, but my question is, um, I do a lot of sports. Um, almost six days a week, I would send martial arts for anywhere from two hours to three to four hours. Um, even doing all this, is it still... Uh, possible to maintain that not eat after 12 o'clock? Is it just mental or do we need to take into account the physical aspect as well? Both. Uh, it's mental and physical. See, this is the middle way again, is that the, when you look at sort of a more monastic life, there's a lot of reasons that we, we don't eat afternoon, but it's not sort of uh, that we have to abstain from absolutely everything. So you can have juice, you can have dark chocolate, uh, for monks and nuns, that is. Uh, uh, you could have fruit or something like that. Uh, it, it's not a starvation diet. But what you find is that um, if you have a big heavy meal at dinner, you feel almost hung over the next day. You know, you can really sort of tell if you sort of experiment and uh, so just have a very, very light supper or, you know, just something in terms of uh, not eating afternoon or something like that, and then have a nice big dinner and everything else. You, you feel really queasy the next day. Um, so that, that does help with the meditation because your mind is a lot lighter. But if you're doing a lot of work, if you're doing a lot of sport and everything else, don't starve yourself. You know, it's really important. You know, keep up, you know, the, your energy and everything else because then you can't meditate or work or function. It's a, it's a really middle way approach there. So uh, uh, you can take it easier, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, well, I have uh, the Venerable here to, uh, to sign me out, so um, shall we call it a night? <laughs>